For everyone, there's a taste of food or a smell of cooking that zooms you right back to childhood. It's just like my mum's cake. I'm Brian Turner. It reminds me of someone I used to know at school. <laughs> and I'm going to stir up the food memories of some much-loved celebrities. Oh, oh, look at that. Going back to their early days before they were famous. Oh, my gosh. With recollections of Sunday roasts and school dinners. It's time for something to eat. Brilliant. And celebrating food their home regions are proud of. <laughs> Which way would you like to go? Uh, this way. I'll recreate a nostalgic family favourite. Mm. You can't beat a crumble. And a tribute dish that puts my guest life on a plate. Magic. Magic. Today, television presenter Johnny Ball is back in his hometown, Bristol. He'll be revisiting old haunts. That was our sweet shop. But during the war, there were no sweets. And telling tall tales from bygone days. W.G. Grace actually hit the ball over the spire. While I'll be cooking dishes that should unlock some long-forgotten memories. Oh, you're going to love that, lad. Johnny was born in 1938 to Daniel and Nan, who'd moved to Bristol from Lancashire. Bristol was one of England's most important ports, and it's still proud of its maritime heritage. Perhaps its most famous son, apart from Johnny, of course, is Victorian engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who designed its docks, its railway station, and its most famous landmark, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Brunel was Johnny's childhood hero, so we're starting our journey into his food memories against this amazing backdrop. Johnny, Hello. Hi. how are you doing? I'm very well. I'm what fine. a very pretty view Isn't this gorgeous? is. Look Isn't at that. Gorgeous? When I was about seven at school, the only drawing I ever did, and said, do a drawing, anything you like, was two green blobs <laughs> on the bridge across. It was so easy, but I love the bridge, and it's just, just wonderful. Have bridge. you ever kept any of those pictures? No, I don't think so. I don't think they're worth keeping. No, but they must be worth a fortune now. No. Johnny the Ball. The teacher would have rather hung me than the picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down and have a chat and tell me more of these stories. Certainly, certainly. What were you good at at school? I, I was immediately good at maths because my dad uh, always played maths games with me. He built a bagatelle table, you know, with the marble, but he built it, and it was much more ornate and elaborate than the other ones. And I could total the numbers as the ball fell in, yeah. you see. And then at school, the, the teacher, we used to, we want homework, we want no. homework. Can you imagine all I those can't, I can't, I can't, no. Was, and they, he said, you don't get homework till you're nine, and we were seven. We want homework. So he got these horrible Xerox copies. They would always smell oily because right. of the copying system in those days. And there'd be a hundred simple additions or subtractions or multiplications. He said, if you do 10, I'm happy. And me and about four others would do all hundred. In the 1970s, maths and science made Johnny a household name when he inspired a generation of children with his programmes Think of a Number and Think Again. Night wrote glycerine is the stuff. And apparently you don't even need a match. Just a little tap with an hammer. Oh, 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 oh mate. I'll be nobbled. <laughs> but back when Johnny himself was a child, he was living in a country at war. How did Bristol cope during the war? Was it badly affected? Well, it, I think there were four nights of blitz. And the first one, every other house around us had an, an area, an Anderson shelter, yeah. uh, with a concrete, a concrete coffin almost, and it would fit two households. So we went in there with the church to live next door, you know. Over three and a half million Anderson shelters were distributed across the country in the early war years. They were designed to be part buried and then covered with soil for protection from falling bombs. We didn't like it. We didn't, it was horrible. <laughs> Just me and my mum. My dad was on nights, you see. Right. So that was the first night that we didn't get hit. The second one, we went under the stairs. In, in your in house? cupboard under the stairs in our house, me and my mum. And the third night and the fourth night, we were under the kitchen table. 
that'll do. Just another kitchen tape. Those yeah. must be memories that will stay with you for forever. Very much. We, uh, nothing was hit anywhere near us. But when we came shopping a, a few weeks later, St Mary Radcliffe, the church, was totally left, un unmarked, but everything around it was blitzed. Everything was just uh, department stores completely gone. Rationing must have played a, a very big it part in everybody's lives. It was a very big thing. You, 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 had, you had ration books, you know, and you had to give your coupons in, and you had to know your butcher to get, get your pieces. It's a bit like Dad's army. I it really generally <laughs> was. You had to be friends with your butcher. Yeah. And I remember my dad used to, on a Sunday, right, because eggs were so rationed and so scarce, my dad used to, used to give me a mark. Do you remember a mark? A slice of bread, rub it in his yolk. There you are. And that was my... My egg. Just a, do you know, I've never egg. heard that one before. That's amazing. Quite amazing, that is, isn't it? <laughs> so, what do you remember eating in those days, in your junior school days? I, I remember my mother used to make a lot of stews, and she and there was a problem because she used to thicken the stews with barley, right? Yeah. So it's a scouse sort of yeah, a, yeah. That type of thing, but with barley. Well, the barley made me cockle. Terrible. Cockle. Choke. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and I couldn't take it, and the sweat used to pour out of me because of its consistency, barley. And uh, so I couldn't eat my Sunday lunchtime. Did you have a war with your mum then, was it? With she, my dad. My dad, since yeah, my dad you're eating that lad, you know? Chair. Did he? Yeah, yeah. Virtually every Sunday lunchtime. Before they took the food away cold, you know. And it was, that was very tired because everything else of my childhood was very happy. It was the, that was the only thing of, of, that I remember. Oh my God, do I remember it. You used to get a lot of offal. Now, not many people like offal. How did you get that? That's right. That was, that was fine. Liver. I've, we've always liked liver. I think we had um, not so much lamb's liver as pig's liver in those days. I think it was cheaper and it was yeah. easier to get. You also had cheese in milk. Yes. You, you'd have a metal plate yeah. and you'd cut the cheese and just, just almost cover it with milk. And that was it, and just grill it, just like that. My and dad used to do that, oh, would you it's, just, it's just gorgeous, you can't beat it. After the war, cheese was one of the items that was still rationed. Each person was allowed three ounces in old money, that's 75 grams today. But what I've ordered for us looks like a couple of months worth. Wow, look at that. Whoops. A real ploughman's. Thank you. Well, it is, isn't it? We've got a bit of fruit there. We've Beautiful. got some cheese. We've got gherkins, onions, eggs. A bit of bread looks fantastic. It's definitely yeah? not wartime rationing ploughmans. This is certainly not. And what about other foods that you eat now? What kind of things do you like? Anything. Everything. Really? Oh, yeah. We love we love the fishes. We love, we love the mackerel and, and the oily fishes. And well, that oh. reminds me, of course, that your mum and dad coming from Lancashire wouldn't eat cod. Oh, no. Cod a dirty fish. Swims on the bottom, eats all the rubbish. Oh, it wasn't full of worms. That's had why to... I love it. <laughs> oh, no, it had to be haddock. Because in Bristol, I've read it. Gurnet. Did you get gurnet? Gurnard. Is that gurnard? Well, it's called gurnet in Bristol. Right. And I think that was a cheaper fish. It's got a lot of bone to it. Yeah, it can. It's got have. a tough head. Yeah. Mm. But actually, it's, it's got a nice flavour to it. Mm. Yeah. That is lovely. That really is lovely. A ploughman was always cheddar cheese and nothing else but cheddar cheese. You, you know, know they, they say that cheddar cheese is probably the most eaten cheese in the whole world these days. And it should be. It's gorgeous. It's an adulterated. When you say it's gorgeous, is that because of the cheddar gorgeous? <laughs> oh, no, behave, Because I did, I missed it. I'm sorry. <laughs> The Southwest isn't just home to arguably the world's favourite cheese, cheddar. There are over two and a half thousand dairy farms here. I've come to Marshfield Farm to find out what makes this part of the world so good for milk production. Morning, Will. Hi, Brian. How are you doing, boss? Thank you. How are you? Yeah. Will Hawking has lived on the farm since he was a child. So, Will, we're on the very edge of the Cotswolds, but we're really in the heart of the West Country. What is it that makes dairy farming so prolific? Uh, it's probably got one of the best climates in the world for, for dairy farming. At the end of the day, the key thing that you need is a, is a mild climate and a steady, fairly high rainfall to produce grass. 
Uh, what the cow does for us is to take that grass and to turn it into what we can make and sell, which is milk. So these are easily recognisable cattle, and I assume they chose them because their qualities are good for dairy produce. Exactly. So these are, are Frisians, but they also have some, some Holstein blood in them as well. They have phenomenal ability to convert grass to milk. Milk machines. Exactly. Nowadays, the cows are milked twice a day in purpose-built milking parlours where it's all about cleanliness. But cows are cows, so you wouldn't go to work here wearing your best suit. So this is the action part now. We're going to actually see where the milk, actually how it's unloaded from the cattle, yeah? This is the business end, really. Yeah. We're togged up as we are. We're fully togged up. I'm sorry about this. Ready? I know no, this has been a bit of a shock to your system. I'd much rather it be this way than get caught out, because it's messy in there sometimes. It is messy, I'm afraid. That's part of the job. Let's go and get this job done. OK. We can do it. <laughs> In all my years drinking milk and eating cheese, this will be a first for me. You'd like to have a go at milking a cow, Brian? Well, I'm going to see how it works, yes. There's a good, strong vacuum there. Yeah. Can you just get my finger out? So... Oh. Each of the... Each of the liners onto the teats of the cow, and away she goes, and you can see the milk coming quite fast. She'll only take about two minutes to uh, give us probably 20 litres. And it's, there's no pain, it's just... It's oh, in fact, no, they, they need it. to be milked. They love to be milked. In fact, yeah. in the robotic system, cows will naturally come in four or five times a day to be milked. They, they, they like the, 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 the relief, I think, really, of, yeah. of unlugging the milk. Now, do you think you can locate them onto the cow's teats? So, this one goes onto... That one goes over there, be careful. That's it. I'll get the inside one. Okay. That one goes on there. That's it. Get on there. Perfect. I got the other one. All right. You will see the milk. And your man James does this by himself normally. James does it all by himself. You can see starting at the back end. And he's end. doing 250 cattle. About 200 in milk at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Every every morning and every evening. Yeah. Quite amazing, isn't it? Hey, really. Every day, Will's herd produces up to 10,000 litres of milk. But it's not all destined to be drunk. In 1988, Will's family decided to make something with their milk. Ice cream. It would take a day for our milk to become ice cream. Whether it's exotic mango or good old vanilla, the process is the same. Heat the milk to kill the nasties, chill down again and add natural flavours and colours. It smells fantastic. Will's told me there's one part of the process that's a bit tricky, and I've drawn the short straw. It's not easy. Most people, it takes a good week, so I'm expecting a muddle. So the next one, I'm going to take over The next you, one, yes. OK, so I'll finish this. Yeah, you say go and I'll, I'll take over. You huh? have a go and we'll see how it goes. It looks simple, but I'm sure it's not going to be. We've got huh? a bucket underneath, so it's not the end of the world if you make a muddle. Right. You'll be a natural if you get it. Off you go. Not bad. Very good. Follow around the tub. That's good. Follow around the tub. You right get a bit frightened then when keep, you get keep, near the keep, end. You're doing fine. Keep going. Keep going and to the end. Keep going and up. Not bad. Oh. He's a natural. Yeah, I don't know about that. This is a skill that has to be practised to be learned. It is... You could do this on the generation game, I suspect. Filling it isn't too bad. It's when you get near the end... You've got to dip it right in and pull it get, away. Yeah. yeah. And don't forget, we're going at about third speed here. We're not oh, shut we're... up. You don't have to tell people <laughs> that. Huh? Oh, no, 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 you see, you got me going I've, now. I've, I've ruined it for you. OK, right, off we go. Concentrate, Turner, concentrate. You could have a great future here if you want one, Brian. Hey. Oh, that was a clean one. That's not bad at all. I don't think I'll be giving up the day job anytime soon. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Back in the city, Johnny and I are on the way to his old manor. Johnny's family lived in Kingswood, a 
a suburb on the east side of Bristol, just seven miles from Brunel's famous bridge. Over there, there was an arbor, yeah. and it was absolutely covered in roses, and it was just beautiful. And it was really like a dark cave, even when it was sunny. It was gorgeous. And the playground's down there, and that's still there. And the church was over there. The church was over there, and I was in the Cubs, 111th Kingswood, Bristol, and the school down there. So it's just amazing. It's amazing that so much of it is the same. Was the headmaster at the primary school an officious kind of person? No, the headmaster gentle. was wonderful, and right. the headmaster taught me maths and was one of my inspirations. There's no question about that. He got me going in the right direction. Mr. Well, Benson. the right direction, sir, for Mr. Benson, who won't be there, you go and have a look at the schools. Oh, it yeah. bring back loads of happy memories, and I'm going to cook a little dish, which will also bring back some memories, I hope. Wonderful. You go and enjoy yourself. See you later. Cheers, Johnny. Wow. My old school, and it hasn't changed in the 70 years since I was here, more or less. And I remember the first day, because I was in a classroom over there, and at playtime, they all went out and I was kept in by this horrible teacher because I wouldn't drink my milk. A little bottle of milk. And it smelled sour and awful. I wouldn't drink it. So on my first day, I was kept in at playtime. But I loved the school. I loved being at school. I walked about a mile up the road here every morning. First day, my mother said, tag along with the others, and off I went and walked for a mile. I was never taken to school, never brought home, always walked up on the road here. And afterwards, if we had a penny, and I usually had a penny, we'd go in the shop and look, it hasn't changed. It's still there. And that was our sweet shop. But during the war, there were no sweets. So, what could we have? We used to buy licorice, which was very nice, but it was actually a laxative, and that's what it's supposed to be. Or we'd buy hundreds and thousands for cake decoration and soak them with our finger, because there were no sweets. So we had a tough time, but we survived. I'm planning a dish for Johnny, packed full of childhood memories. I know he likes liver, but I'm going to add some extras to make a cheap ingredient into a feast. Lance kidneys, still in the fat, and some black pudding and I've got some local Somerset cider to make the sauce. First thing we need to do, however, we need to get some onions on cooking away. So we'll just shred these onions nice and finely. Bags of flavour, sweetness, flavour and texture. Leave them to cook slowly. Put some salt and pepper in. And I'm going to put in there a little knob of butter. Really tasty. And just let them slowly cook away. Wow! The senior playground. We're only up to 11. I took my 11 plus here, but this playground didn't have cars or fences. It was a big open space. And we all used to play in here. And we all had hobnail boots. And the great thing about hobnail boots is you could slide in them. But what we'd do is get a chain of kids and they'd run around, and the one on the end was like a water skier hanging on, and wow, we'd swing them around in their hobnail boots and try and smash them into the wall. <laughs> but if you were sensible, you let go just at the right time and either stop yourself against the wall or slam it into some other kids. We were very robust kids. There was no health and safety, but I don't remember any of us coming a cropper in those days. The onions for my dish are softening gently, so I can get on with preparing the rest of the ingredients, starting with kidneys for the sauce. These are lovely when they're in the fats. You can't get them in the fat all the time. Just take the fat off, and there's a skin on the outside of the kidney which peels off as well. Delicious, and they're not expensive either, these. Good for you, very tasty. I'm gonna cut them into a little bit of a dice. Two will probably be enough. Wonderfully sweet shallots would be the base for the sauce. Don't worry if they're not too fine, it's just to get that real 
flavour out of them. And I just want to sweat them off, put, put a bit of butter in there, just to get that flavour on the go. So bags of onions there. And we all know that liver onion works fantastic. Tried and tested throughout the years, perfect marriage. So those onions are on the go, and the shallots just soften them up. And all I do now is just flip them into a pan, make sure you get them all out, which we don't want to burn. And then put the pan back on. A bit more oil in there. A tad of butter. And when it's hot enough, and you need to be patient now, you need to just let the heat get in there so you can hear that the butter's getting hotter. And when it starts to change colour, in go the kidneys. It's hard to get hot enough. Quickly into the pan. And the trick here is not to mess about with it too much. Just let it sit there for a moment, then we'll turn it over, seal it on all sides, get it warm in the middle. See, so it's just been coloured on all sides, so let's take that off and put that in here to keep. We don't want it to overcook, that's a secret. But what I don't want to do is to throw away any of this flavour from the pan. So we've got some wonderful local Somerset cider. And the cider goes in. And it'll start to reduce, washing the flavour of the pan, all collecting together. And we put a bit of chicken stock in there. And we'll just leave that. Just to think, when I was here, I was always top or next to top, and always top in maths. In the Second World War, they had gas masks hanging from the hooks, and they were Mickey Mouse gas masks. They smelled horrible, horrible. You thought you were going to suffocate in them, but they had little ears like Mickey Mouse, just to make kids feel happier in them. We hated them. Mickey Mouse gas masks, Ooh, they gave me nightmares. So far, I've softened a whole heap of onions and cooked some lamb's kidneys with shallots, which I'll add to a cider sauce. Everything else will happen now Johnny's back from his school tour. Hey, up, lad. Oh, that was wonderful. Was it all right? See the old school, yeah. You know, Happy memories. Oh, yes, we are. No, it was all Well, gorgeous. look, I just need to do this fairly quickly because I've put right. together a dish that I think will take you back to your childhood because you had lots right. of offal. Right. So we got some lamb's liver. Yes. I've got some kidneys. Yes. And I've got some black pudding. First, uh -huh. I need to put that lamb's liver on now. It's such a good price and it's so good for you. Yeah. Just get rid of the excess oil. Not too hot, but yet hot. Okay, so I'm going to just turn that over. That looks grand. Lovely. And then a piece of black pudding. This is very northern, but it's not quite Bury Market. I like it when the fat is very fine. Yeah, me like too, that. yeah. Look. I eat black so. pudding sandwiches raw, you know, just black pudding with a little salt. My relations do that. Now, look, yeah. in here I've got some shallots, yeah. some butter, and some kidney. I'm going to put that into the sauce. Excuse me, sir. Uh -huh. Give it a whirl round. There you are. Ah, that's coming together nicely, is that now? Oh, you're gonna love that, lad. Let's have a quick look over here. Oh, look at that black oh, pudding. Beautiful. So I'm gonna take the liver off. Don't want that to overcook, wanna keep it underdone. Uh -huh. And all I need to do now is dress up. Not dress up, dress the plate up, that is, of course. <laughs> you know what I mean, don't you, eh? I do, I do. Oh, look at look those. This. So we'll put a few onions in the middle of the plate. 
That's good. Oh. Take the liver across. Thing in my book is not, to, not to hide everything. Yeah. So we put that down the bottom there. Okay. Mustn't forget a nice lump of black pudding in there. Oh, look, and it's still That's tender. A bit of parsley in there. There's a bit of colour. Make sure I get some of that kidney on the top. And then all I'm going to do is dribble that around. Dribble there. that. Dribble it. So one of those words. What do you think to that, Governor? It looks tremendous. The nostalgia dish I've cooked for Johnny is grilled lamb's liver with black pudding and onions with a kidney and cider sauce. I do hope he likes it. Mr. Miss. Oh, the oh, the kidney is wonderful. Still yep. pink. Still pink. It's lovely. No, oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> but does it remind you of the days when your mum used to give you the stuff that they could afford? It, it, it did. It was the cheaper ends as it, that were available and yeah. you went for. We had it a lot. And it, oh, I loved it. I loved it. Mmm. I love offal too, and it's been a pleasure to make my version of liver and onions for such an appreciative guest as Johnny. It's, so good, far, isn't it? it's all right so far, isn't it, lad? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fresh offal has a short shelf life, and I prefer to buy it from a local butcher who can get me the cuts I'm after. Nowadays, we're all interested in where our food comes from, whether it's meat, fish, or vegetables. In Bristol city centre, there's a food business that's all about growing the freshest food and benefiting the community. In the shadow of Isambard Kingdom Brunel's Temple Mead Station is the headquarters of the Seven Project. It's an urban farm that supplies some of the best shops and restaurants in Bristol and provides much needed work opportunities in the inner city. And what's the crop that's working such miracles? Would you believe it? Simple bags of salad. The founder of the project is addiction counsellor Steve Glover. We started in 2010 with uh, £2,500 and a book by uh, Monty Don. Uh, we learned how to grow food, then we learned how to sell food. This year, 2015, we will probably turn over a half a million pounds. As the project's expanded, they've opened a second site on the outskirts of Bristol to keep up with demand. This site is special because it's, uh, it's been used to grow vegetables since, uh, they say, the end of the First World War. The people who run the allotments, who know the area a lot better than I do, have told us a story that uh, the most fertile land here is where it was bombed by uh, the German uh, bombers in the Second World War, which uh, broke up the limestone pavement which is underneath the clay, allowing the soil to drain better and become more fertile. It's a great story, and even if it is just a suburban myth, there's no denying just how productive this plot's become. On average, we produce and sell 700 kilos a week, which is quite amazing, really. It's a, it's a real feat. This is a list of our, our restaurants. Um, Don Giovanni's is a, an Italian. Earthbound is a small whole food shop. And the Pony and Trap is uh, Michelin Star um, uh, River Cottage. Nice to actually be supplying people like that with salad. It's a bit of a feather in our cap. I'm really proud of this board. Five years ago, as a student and mature student, I couldn't afford to eat in a lot of the restaurants that we supply food to. Everything the project grows is organic. The salad mix contains six different types of leaves and the crop's ready to pick in just three weeks. We're now harvesting uh, for mixed leaf salad. That's the bulk of what we do. They do say that the average uh, lettuce travels 
1,800 miles before it actually gets into the customer's fridge. And uh, in that time, of course, it's degenerating and losing its mineral content. Whereas ours is uh, quite often delivered the same day as it's picked. Most of the places that the project delivers to are within five miles of Temple Mead Station. At the heart of the city is the beautiful St. Nicholas Market. This Victorian covered arcade has become a foodie destination over the last few years. Joe Wheatcroft opened this deli and restaurant in 2009, aiming to sell the best ingredients from this region. The locality is really, really key. Uh, living here in the southwest, I think we are extremely blessed. With it, it's abundant. The land around us is, is, has been producing food for years, and it's really, really good quality. Using local food not only gives you a low food mile, but it also brings you the freshest product you can possibly get. So um, when we're talking about the Seven Project leaves, for example, they're picked on that day or the day before and brought to us and then they're on people's plates that same day. Steve's idea of growing food on a patch of wasteland isn't a new one. In the Second World War, every inch of available land was pressed into service for growing fruit and vegetables. It became everyone's patriotic duty to dig for victory and in neat suburban gardens, homeowners replaced their lawns with runner beans. In the 1930s, there'd been a housing boom across the country, including in Bristol. Many of these new houses were smart semis with big back gardens. That meant lots of room for a spacious vegetable plot, just like Johnny's childhood home. So this is our street, and the grass verges went right out, and the, the, the road was narrower, so there was lots of grass verges, it so was it beautiful. So it wouldn't be as busy road in there. Oh, the exactly. we never saw a car. The right. chap, one of these houses, was the only person in the whole road with a car, and we would go and meet him on his way home, and he would <laughs> give us a lift the in the car. <laughs> so we'd walk two miles to get a lift back, which was lovely, because it was such a novelty with a car. Johnny's parents moved here when he was just a toddler. Mum and Dad were so happy in this house. It was beautiful. And on VE night across there, yeah. we built a bonfire, and it was enormous. And all the troops, everybody celebrated. And all the troops, American, English, all did a crawl through bonfire to bonfire. And they always had some hooch with them. <laughs> and we had a searchlight on a lawn over there, which was probably there, a piano, an upright piano on this one or that one, record players, the people working in the aircraft industry made nights, VE night flashing, and it was just phenomenal. And I was at seven years old, I was still kicking the embers of the bonfire at four o'clock in the morning. It was wonderful and night. you, sir, always been a stayer. Brian Welsh lived over there. Graham Green lived at the end. Graham not, Green? Not the author. So did you have a whole gang of mates? Oh, it was wonderful. We played out here literally till it went dark. We're about nine o'clock at the latest. Yeah. Well, many happy memories about your mate around here. Absolutely. But now I'm going to cook for you outside somewhere that you know very well. I've still about... got the taste of the kidney in my mouth and it's wonderful. You've got to go some to top that. Well, we're going to do that. Memories Great. Now. For the final stage of our trip around Johnny Balls, Bristol, we've come to Frenchier Common, where his family would often spend a relaxing afternoon. Good cricket is played here. And I'm not sure whether they played cricket there, which would be small, tight ground, or whether they played here, which is a much bigger ground. But the story my dad always told me that WG Grace, the greatest, perhaps, of the old cricketers, actually hit the ball over the spire. They'll tell kids anything, won't they? But it's just a lovely, lovely spot. I've designed a tribute dish for Johnny, inspired by his childhood food. It's going to be based around a fish that holds special memories. Just for Johnny, we're going to cook some gurnard because his parents didn't like cod, 
They only liked haddock. Couldn't get much of it, so they ate gurnard. I'm going to serve the gurnard with some green veg that would have been easy to grow in a wartime garden. Peas, onions and lettuce. And a few fresh peas in there. That should be enough. And I'm going to use some chicken stock to cook them in, not water, as Johnny's mum would probably have done. And once again, to make them slightly different, I'm going to use some lettuce to go in there. Just shred it up. Delicious. And then I've got a couple of spring onions. We'll do the same with those. We'll just shred them up. So, put the spring onions in first. And then I've got these lovely mange two peas. Eat all peas. And all we're going to do is going to shred these. Lovely, look at that, lovely colour. And a bit of lettuce and all. And that goes in there. Salt and pepper. Won't take too long, about five to ten minutes. On the edge of the common is a place that Johnny should know well. Last time I was here, I was about ten, I think. And my dad loved this pub, and so did I, because there was always kids to play with and it was great fun. And we only came when it was a beautiful sunny day. <laughs> Hello there. Can I have a pint? Um, oh, oh, I like that one. Yeah, this, this end one is fine. Yeah. yeah. We would walk miles. This pub is three and a half miles from where my house was, and we would walk here. And this was one of the nicest ones. We'd play out on the grass out there, and we'd run around and run around until we were dizzy and daft. And I remember falling down, absolutely exhausted out there, and I didn't know, and I had my eyes closed, and suddenly I opened my eyes, and my dad is pouring my bottle of lemonade onto my face. <laughs> and all, everybody around is laughing. It was the human spirit. People got together and had fun and relaxed. And in wartime, that was very important. So here's to pubs. The veg for my tribute dish is bubbling away. I've got two types of peas, fresh and mange too, as well as shredded little gem and spring onions on the go. I've got those all cooking away nicely. Hello, mate. How's How are you it doing? going? It's going very well. How's your trip been? Do you know, it hasn't changed a bit, I said. And they said, yes, it has. It's double the size of when I was here as a kid. But when I was little, it was a big pub anyway, because I was little. Did you ever go inside it when you were a kid? I think allowed to? I don't remember a children's room here, but most of them in this part of the world had yeah. children's rooms, and they were lovely. But if it was fine, you just played out on the lawn here, and it was just fine. Well, bags of space here, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's right, now let me tell you what I've done. Look, right. this, you remember your fish, Gurnard? Yes. This is Gurnard yeah. from Cornwall. Just really, that's a nice little small fish, and I've filleted this one here. Mm. But what we've done, very carefully, we've taken all the bones out. Right. I'm going to put a bit of oil in there and a wee bit of butter. So would this have been a cheap uh, fish in the war, or an available fish in the it war? It would have been an available fish, and you're quite right, it wouldn't do, it'll be an inexpensive yeah, fish. Right. Nothing was cheap in those, I don't <laughs> think. Right. And today is the same, it is not the most expensive of fishes. So look, as soon as that starts to change colour, it goes in, skin side down, and the trick is just to hold it for a little while, it's cold, you Until won't burn the yourself. Until your fingers. Just, no, not at all, till <laughs> it just sets. Wow. Because if yeah. you don't, otherwise the heat makes it curl up. Right. So we just okay. put that. Wow. Like all fish, you want to make sure you don't overcook it. No. So a bit of salt. salt. Oh, my dad had salt on his food like snow. <laughs> yeah, I know. So some people do. It's not a great idea, but you do need salt to give it a flavour. But that's yeah. really going to be, and it won't take long to cook. Well, we so, never had that much butter in the war. You do realise that. I know. Well, this is this actually is still left on your ration book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I'll turn it over. Doesn't that look nice? Oh, gorgeous. See, I think that looks that looks very pretty. Does that? Mm. Over here, 
I've melted some butter, just a little bit of butter, could have been margarine, right. and some flour. Right. And you take a little bit and you just put that in there like that and then give it a stir. And that will just help to thicken it up. So instead of having a gravy, it'll just hold it all together. Yeah. It's just peas in the French style. But for today, oh, we're in French Air Common, so we're, <laughs> we're <laughs> almost there. We are, there. Lovely. Ah. OK. And with this, I'm just going to take that oil and butter. Oh, just put it over the top there, just to cook it. You've got to keep this underdone. You don't want to overdo fish. You right. don't want it raw. Precisely. But you just got to make sure, and yeah. that, I think... And will you eat the skin as well now? That I it's personally fresh. don't like the skin on this fish. Some people do. Yeah. But the nice thing is it protects it. Yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take this off here. Look, it's starting to get a bit thick. Getting... I'm going to take that off. That's ready to go. This is just about ready. Right. So let me this take that. Plate. Yeah, if you put that, that plate there here? for me, please, yeah. Right. I'm just going to take these off for a second. And what I'm going to do is put a little bit of butter in this pan here. Yes, we definitely never had that much butter in a year. So look, <laughs> two, we've got peas, two different oh. kind of peas. Peas, fresh garden peas. Monk's two peas. Yeah. We got spring onion. We got lettuce in there. Yeah, the lettuce. They got a lovely cut. That's what I like about this dish. It's got yeah. just lovely colour to it. Uh huh. I'm going to take that one there. And in this butter here, I'm going to squeeze lemon juice in. Uh huh. That'll just stop it cooking, stop right. it colouring anymore, which is what I want. And I'm just going to lay that quickly over the top. Just give it that lovely bit of colour there. And then the last little bit. These are pea shoots. They are quite tasty. We used to throw them away once upon a time. Really? But I'm just going to take a couple of pea shoots. And there you are, dear boy. My tribute dish for Johnny is beautiful fillets of Gurnard a fish he enjoyed as a child. I'm serving them with a sauce of spring vegetables, fresh peas, mange too, spring onions, and little gem lettuce, all braised in chicken stock, as a reminder of those wartime mums and dads digging for victory. I wonder if I can remember the taste. That's lovely. It's all right, though, isn't it? I can't recollect. But that is lovely. And you've got shredded lettuce in here as well. Lettuce and the spring onions. Monster stew, peas, chicken stock and mm. butter. Mm. Gorgeous. Really is. Oh, if we'd have had butter during the war, it would have been wonderful. <laughs> oh, look at that. So that's gone down well. Oh, that's lovely. I don't recall that it was like that at all when I, when I was a child. No, probably neither you would. You were a bit young. But what about the rest of the day? I've loved it, you know. And Bristol always gives me happy memories. I love the place. I really do. Well, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Oh, it's been fantastic. Enjoy the rest Thank of that fish. I will, I will. And tomorrow it's the turn of Dancing Queen Arlene Phillips. Tonight in the square, Abby makes a discovery that leads to an angry confrontation with Louise. A lively start to our night of drama here on BBC One with EastEnders at 7.30. Stay with us for Flog It! Best Finds coming up next.